Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Transit Signal Priority, ConOps for a Cooperative Driving Automation Environment. My name is Zach Pleasant, and I'll be helping with facilitating today's webinar. This webinar is sponsored by Federal Highway Administration in cooperation with the National Operations Center of Excellence, or NOCO. As a quick reminder, if you don't know already, at NOCO, we offer a variety of resources to support the transportation systems management and operations community. On the upper right-hand side of your screen, you can see a box called Useful Links. You can browse through those links for TSMO resources and news. Previous webinar recordings and case studies related to this topic can be accessed from there. Now I'll cover a few logistics for today's webinar. We are recording this webinar, and the recording, along with the presentation slides, will be available through the on-demand learning section of our website. All the attendees' phones are on listen-only mode by default, but we'd like you to stay engaged by using the question discussion pod for comments and questions. We have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar, so if you have any questions, we encourage all of you to enter them in the questions pod as they come to your mind at any time. Questions will be read aloud one at a time by the moderator, and our presenters will answer each question. So that is all I have. And with that, I'll hand it over to our moderator, Nicole Palado, to start us off. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nicole Palado. I'm a communications professional at Lido, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for this first Karma Tismo webinar on transit signal priority in a CDA environment. We are so excited to share lots of info with you today and also hear uh, about your experiences and questions on this topic. We have a great group of presenters, so I will introduce you to the people you'll hear from today, and then we can dive right into it. So to joining, uh, joining us today is Steve Mortensen. Steve is a senior ITS engineer with the Federal Transit Administration Office of Research Demonstration and Innovation. He is also the uh, FTA lead for the US DOT's Connected Vehicle for Safety and Mobility Program and Integrated Corridor Management Research. Next, we have Govind Vadadpa. Govind is a highway research engineer with the Office of Operations Research and Development at the Federal Highway Administration. He manages several projects in cooperative automation and has over 20 years of experience in research and deployment for highway traffic operations. We also have Larry Head. Larry is a professor of systems and industrial engineering and director of the engineering design program at the University of Arizona. He has over 25 years of research and development experience focused in traffic signal control, signal priority, traffic management, and connected and autonomous vehicle systems. We also have Amir Giazi. Amir is a principal investigator for two CAV research projects working to enable CDA and enhance infrastructure efficiency. Uh, his work focuses on connected autonomous vehicles, cooperative automation, ITS, traffic operations, as well as modeling and simulation work. And finally, we have Sajith Racha. Sujith is the ITS manager overseeing several research projects, including the Karmatismo project at the Federal Highway Administration Saxton Transportation Operations Laboratory, uh, Turner Fairbank High Reach, Highway Research Center. He has over 17 years of experience in transportation research, engineering design, and analysis. So as you can see, we have a really knowledgeable group to talk with you today. And with that, I will hand it over to Sajith so we can get started. Thank you, Nicole. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Like uh, Nicole said, uh, I am the ideas uh, manager for the Federal Highways Research Program, CARMA, that is the Cooperative Automotive Research for Mobility Application. I'm sure that many of you are aware of this research program. Uh, so the, pro the project that I'm managing under this program deals with the transportation system management and operations, which is TISMO use cases using CARMA. The primary goal of this project is to advance Karma ecosystem by enabling cooperative driving automation, CDA, features for the vehicles to interact with the infrastructures, like uh, traffic signals, especially at the arterial level. Also applying CDA to enhance TISMO and uh, improve safety and efficiency. So the main objective for this project is to develop concept of operations and the proof of concept testing for several TISMO use cases identified by the project team. 
One such use case that we are working currently is the transit signal priority, and we would like to discuss today on how the Karma ecosystem would contribute to the development of TSP using use case scenarios in cooperative driving automation environment. How the Karma ecosystem could better serve the TSP community goals and expectations, and also the functional needs and requirements for developing and deploying uh, TSP applications in CDA environment. Uh, along with me, uh, you know, we have Amir Giazi, who is the principal investigator on the project, uh, will be talking uh, with us uh, shortly, and Larry Head from University of Arizona, uh, who is helping us with this research. Amir and Larry will be uh, talking on the framework uh, shortly. Uh, Govin is the government task manager for this pro uh, project, uh, and he'll be providing an overview on CDA program uh, momentarily. Uh, we also have uh, Steve, uh, who is representing our transit group today. And uh, at this point, I would uh, like uh, Steve to provide some opening remarks with respect to TSP to, the, to our transit stakeholders. Steve. Thank you, Sujit. And uh, welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining us today for today's uh, webinar on creating a concept of operations for transit signal priority in a cooperative driving automation environment. This is one in a series of webinars on karma, uh, transportation systems, and management uh, and operations. As Nicole said, I'm uh, Steve Mortensen. I work in the Federal Transit Administration's Office of Research, Demonstration, and Innovation. As many of you know, uh, FTA and uh, FHWA have had a long-standing relationship working together on multimodal uh, research initiatives such as integrated corridor management, connected vehicles for mobility and safety. Uh, we worked with stakeholders to develop and demonstrate connected vehicle dynamic mobility applications, such as if you remember the Integrated Dynamic Transit Operations, or IDTO, uh, bundle of applications, and the Multimodal Intelligent Traffic Signal Systems, or MITS, which TSP is a part. And now uh, we are conducting research together on connected and automated vehicles, including FHWA's KARMA program. As uh, Sujith stated, today we are going to walk through some use cases and scenarios outlined in the concept of operations for TSP in a KARMA cooperative driving automation, or CDA for short, environment. And we would like to get uh, your feedback uh, before I hand it back over to Sujith, I, um, as I was reading the CONOPS, there was one sentence that was in the CONOPS that particularly struck me. I thought it uh, tied everything very well together, so I'm going to read it. The emergence of CDA, the Karma ecosystems, and MITS together provides a strong case for creating a new and effective transit management system for signalized arterials. So with that, I'd like to hand the webinar back over to Sujith. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Steve. Before we jump into today's presentation, uh, let me read the uh, disclaimer that this presentation was created and being co-presented by both FSW and the contractor. The views and opinions expressed in this presentation are the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Highway Administration or the U.S. Department of Transportation. The contents do not necessarily reflect the official policy of the U.S. DOD. Okay, with that, uh, today we'll be providing you uh, uh, an overview of the following topics, and uh, here is the agenda. And we'll be talking about transportation system management and operations for transit management, uh, especially transit uh, signal priority. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking uh, about cooperative driving automation and uh, uh, how Karma program uh, relates to that and provide an overview on that. Uh, we'll also be talking about multimodal intelligent traffic signal system, MITS, uh, provide an overview on that uh, and how it is helpful uh, with, with our use case uh, application here. Um, so we'll be uh, having, uh, you know, in more information uh, to share on uh, TISMA and TSP using the Karma ecosystem and uh, some TSP scenarios and uh, anticipated benefits 
uh, for using Karma for the TSP scenarios. Uh, after that, we'll open the floor for questions and answers. Before uh, I turn this over to Larry uh, to start his uh, uh, presentation on the framework, uh, I'll ask uh, Nicole to uh, provide a couple of uh, poll questions for you guys to answer. Uh, basically, we would like to understand here as a group, like, you know, uh, what, what is your affili affiliation and, uh, you know, what brings you here today. So, Nicole. Yeah, like uh, Suji said, uh, it would be great for everyone um, to respond with what brings them here today, um, your what organization you're affiliated with, and your role, just to get a sense of who's here today, um, who's part of the conversation, and, and any commonalities we might see. Got some folks from FHWA, Michigan Tech University, University of Oklahoma. Wow, lots of lots of different organizations here today. That's great. That's great. Uh, we have a good mix of uh, uh, academia as well as uh, uh, you know private and public uh, organization. Uh, moving on with the next question, what brings you here today? So your basic interest uh, or uh, If you want to type in like, you know, uh, type of operations that you're involved with, whether it might be transit versus traffic system. Interest in CAV technology. Wonderful. Some Karma platform users. To get an understanding of the application is great. A range of interests and a range of topics. Hopefully we'll get um, your questions answered today. And just a reminder, if you have any questions that come up um, throughout the presentation, please put those um, in the question discussion pod, and we'll do our best to address those uh, at the end of the presentation. Great. Um, Thank you for providing those uh, responses. Uh, that will be very helpful. And I'm sure like, you know, may, uh, many of the topics today that we are touching uh, are going to be of uh, your interest. Uh, with that, uh, I will have uh, Larry present uh, on his information on the uh, objectives, assumptions, and on the framework. Larry. Thanks, Sujit. So one of the things that we want to accomplish is to, to have a discussion about using CDA, Cooperative Driving Automation, to develop the TISMO strategies for transit management on arterials and, and really look at the use of transit signal priority as one of those tools. And then uh, eventually in the project, our goal is to demonstrate this TISMO TSB capability using the Karma ecosystem, uh, including Karma Cloud, Karma Streets, and Karma Platform. And we'll get into the role each of those will play in simulation in a field test environment. And I think it's, it's important to state, you know, our, one of our assumptions up front is that transit is really a normal part of traffic operations. It's not an exception like incident management might be. It's a normal part of moving people using the roadway system. And so, so we want to be able to accommodate transit as part of that. 
and then we want to use transit signal priority as, as a, a TISMO strategy to help improve the level of service for transit. So when we talk about the things that we can do or, or the parts of the use case for, for transit management, clearly one thing we could do is just treat transit vehicles as part of the traffic stream and don't do anything special, don't give priority, sort of the do nothing case. And I think that's an important case to uh, consider. So Pat, um... Excuse me, could you mute please? Um, so that's an important part of the use case to consider is the fact that we might do um, nothing. And then the, the basic signal priority at an intersection, uh, so one intersection giving priority sort of in isolation is something that we've been doing for a long time and we could do that. We could give priority to a, a route level to a group of traffic signals to help move a transit vehicle through. We can use transit signal priority to help a transit vehicle get to a near side transit stop. Um, we can use it for queue jump to let a transit vehicle get out ahead of a, a, a discharging queue, uh, maybe when they want to change lanes or, or something. Um, when we're making the decision to give transit signal priority, we could be cognizant about downstream congestion and we can um, decide, well, we could give priority here and disrupt traffic a little bit or not give priority because the vehicle's gonna be delayed downstream anyway. Uh, another thing that we can do is we can get different levels of transit service priority, like maybe bus rapid transit would get priority all the time and maybe express service would get priority uh, in, the, in the commute hours, and then maybe some local or paratransit service would get priority under different conditions. That really becomes the, the policy of the operating agency. And then another concept that's kind of become discussed lately is this idea of using the cooperative driving automation and connected vehicle technology to do what's called bus lane intermittent priority, or think of it as transit lane intermittent priority. And I think it's always really important to keep the, the transit consideration um, when we're making decisions like they're trying to run a reliable service. So, so schedule or headway lateness is a factor when they might want to ask and use something like transit signal priority. And vehicle occupancy could be another consideration in making those decisions. And again, it goes to the, the us developing the tools so that the operating agency can operate the, the traffic management system in the right way. So if we think of those different things and we look at this arterial system with transit operations, there's transit stops, there's multiple transit vehicles flowing through. Uh, we could give the signal on the right-hand side, there's a transit vehicle approaching, it's just turning to yellow. If we had done a, a green extension or some type of extending the green there, then that transit vehicle might have got some service um, to be able to get to the stop where we have those very important things that look like pedestrians, but the transit people like to think of them as customers because they are the people that, that are using it to the transit system, okay? And again, on this type of a, a situation, we could be considering route priority, maybe getting it all the way through the left intersection and the right intersection uh, to keep it moving. But when we consider those things, there's some things that we have to take in mind. Um, so as the transit vehicle moves down the street, and the blue line is to represent the trajectory of the transit vehicle moving through the, the upstream signal towards the downstream signal, but it comes to a transit stop and it's gonna dwell. And it's gonna dwell for some amount of time that is dependent on uh, the number of passengers that are boarding and alighting, the type of vehicle that's there, whether they have one door or two doors and, and fare payment systems and things like that generates a random amount of time. So we don't know exactly how long the vehicle may be there. It may be there even a lot longer than we've shown in this illustration. And then it'll move down the arterial and then it gets to another stop and it may dwell again. So by the time we get to the traffic signal or we get to the other side of the traffic signal, we've got almost a full cycle of uncertainty about our arrival time. And so um, we really can, can use our tools to help improve this, uh, the traffic signal side of the delays that are there, uh, but we really can't adjust uh, do anything to adjust the, the boarding and alighting types of stops, but we have to be mindful of it. And when we operate transit vehicles in a coordinated traffic signal system, and there's gonna be one, two, or three stops between the signals, we really need to be mindful that by the time that transit vehicle arrives at the downstream signal, it could well be out of the, the progression band of the coordination that's there. So here's a, the near side stop type scenario where 
You can see here on the right-hand side, there's a transit vehicle pulling up behind three cars. The traffic signal is, again, turning to yellow, so those cars are going to be delayed. And the business of boarding and alighting passengers would happen at that transit stop. So if we could extend the, the traffic signal, just allow three more vehicles to get through on the order of six seconds maybe, then that transit vehicle could get to the transit stop. The boarding and alighting that could go on could go on during the, the red phase, and then the signal could be asked for early green and give it a little priority and move it on. And that fits into the natural operations of the, the, the signals. Near side stops are popular in some transit systems because if a transit customer or passenger is moving from one direction to another direction, they can very easily make the connection. Where if you have far side stops, um, that makes the, the much further for them to travel. And so here's a, another type of time phase diagram illustrating what happens with, with the queue delay and the dwell delay at the downstream transit stop. And so anything that we can do to reduce that, to get the vehicles uh, to get to the stop, board and light the passengers, and then get back into the traffic stream uh, without being too disruptive is really highly desirable. And then this illustrates the downstream congestion idea. So this transit vehicle upstream signal is approaching the signal. It's still green. We could hold it green for it. Uh, that would cause perhaps some delay for the vehicles on the side street. But when we look downstream, we can see that that signal, again, is turning yellow. There's a huge queue of vehicles that's there. So there'll be almost no benefit in doing that. By the time this signal cycles through and the vehicle stops at its stop and gets down there, that queue maybe will have dissipated. Uh, so making the decisions at the local signal based on downstream conditions could also be very important. And then finally, um, or, or not finally, but the consideration of different levels of service. Really, when we look at, at transit scenarios, there could be things like this shows a bus rapid transit lane. That's a bus only lane in the middle <clears throat> with a bus rapid transit vehicle operating in it. There's an express bus leaving the intersection on the left going towards a stop where the, the express bus will stop. But there's another transit stop down there a little further that the express bus is not going to stop at. Um, that's a local stop for a local bus. So using the information that could be available about where the stops are and, and, and which vehicles are going to stop at which stop and which vehicles that, that the agency wants to give priority to all become an integrated part of this decision environment uh, that we, we can make decisions about. Uh, here's the queue jump idea. Uh, so notice that when you do a queue jump, you'd have to have lane by lane signals. I've seen situations where there's a transit only lane and then they use a T signal or other kinds of signalization to allow the transit vehicle to move through. But this would allow the transit vehicle to get out into the traffic and get ahead of the, the vehicles that are there so they could maybe make a lane change so if their route was going to turn left. And so this is a, a really important tool in considering how to operate the transit system to give some benefit to the transit vehicles. And then this illustrates the idea of bus lane intermittent priority. So now that bus lane where the BRT was operating is now um, a shared lane. It's buses when there's buses local, but when there's not buses present, then other vehicles can occupy the lane. And so this makes a lot of sense if you have a, a BRT system or something where you have 15-minute headways between vehicles. If you spend 15 minutes with a whole lane of capacity not being used, that can really impact traffic congestion. And so with cooperative driving automation, we could inform those vehicles, the automated driving vehicles that they need to get out of the way or the human-driven vehicles that there's a transit vehicle coming and, and by the operating policy they need to get out of the way, we can have a huge benefit to both regular vehicles and the transit vehicle. So it's an interesting concept. So I'm going to turn it back over to um, Govind to talk to us about the CDA program. Govind? Thank you, Larry. Uh, I will, in the next few minutes, uh, provide a brief overview of our research here at the Federal Highway Administration that we are conducting in the area of CDA and how this current effort uh, fits in with the bigger picture as it relates to uh, overall mobility and safety goals. So what is CDA? Uh, CDA is a mechanism that enables uh, automated vehicles to work together with other connected entities. Uh, these could include vehicles, pedestrians, and the infrastructure. The primary goal of which is to improve mobility and safety. So we at the USDOT are at the forefront of this research enabled through our CARMA program. 
Before I talk about the, the Karma program, I just want to provide some information on this uh, SAE standard. So the lexicon for uh, CDA standard was established in the SAE standard J3216 that pretty much defines CDA as automation that uses machine-to-machine -machine communications uh, to enable cooperation among two or more entities. So this uh, table pretty much summarizes the cooperation classes A through D and how it relates to the automation levels detailed in the SAE standard J3016. So for instance, class A deals with entities sharing their status. That is, uh, here I am information and here's what I can see. At the other end of the communication class is class D, which directs the entities to follow certain rules. So with that uh, in, uh, in mind, so we have uh, developed our CDA program. So our research is focused uh, not only on how to improve existing uh, transportation management and system operation strategies, but what are those new strategies that are going to be made possible by adopting CDA? So we have published a couple of uh, documents uh, that lays out our blueprint for the TISMO strategies at a high level, and we have also examined CDA uh, at a detailed level for four specific use cases uh, along freeways. So these include basic travel, uh, work zone management, road weather management, and traffic incident management. We are currently in the process of prototyping these uh, applications, and uh, we will be testing these use cases in a closed course setting. Coming back to the Karma program, what exactly is this? So the Karma program established by the Federal Highway Administration is focused on improving the TISMO uh, by leveraging emerging automated driving capabilities and vehicle to everything communications capabilities. So we are not treating this as an isolated function or a strategy, but the idea is to treat this as a multimodal approach that improves the efficiency of the overall transportation system. Talking very briefly about the Karma system, uh, I know this slide is kind of uh, busy, but I'll try to unpack some of the uh, key concepts from this slide. So the Karma program, we have established an ecosystem of products and features that is going to help us study the interface of systems of systems. So we are hoping that these tools will provide us with an opportunity in the understanding of how these systems can manage our transportation system more efficiently and in a safe manner. As you can see from the graphic here, we have a lot of products that are currently under development. Some of the key aspects include the Karma Float platform, which resides in the vehicle, Karma Messenger, which is a vehicle-based system without uh, CDA capabilities, Karma Cloud, which acts as a virtual TMC, and it provides the rules of engagement for Karma. Karma Street is an important concept that we're developing, which provides edge capability computing, edge, edge computing capability. And we're also developing tools to evaluate the system, which includes a lot of capabilities for modeling and simulation, testing and analytics, we are also developing one-tenth capability for Karma, which opens up this research to a lot of universities and research institutions, which brings the barrier very low in terms of cost of conducting these tests. So we also have an active public engagement facet to this research program, wherein we provide active support to the research community. So as part of the Karma uh, CDA research, we have uh, three research tracks in the CDA program. And these uh, three research tracks include traffic, reliability, and freight. As you can see from the partners listed for the each track that are listed here, this is a multimodal effort within the US DOT. And we are focusing on the research areas that are most critical to each model agency. So with that, I'm going to hand things back over to Larry. Thanks, Govin. So we wanted to. I guess actually I'll turn it over to Nicole to do the poll questions. We wanted to ask a, a couple more questions about uh, your thoughts on these use cases and improvements. Yeah, thanks, Larry. Um, yeah, we would we would love to know your feedback on this. So um, feel free to answer um, uh, in the poll pod. We 
We're seeing mostly yeses, uh, some unsures. A couple no's. So maybe throughout the rest of the presentation, we can clear up some, some of the unsures. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nicole. So we want to talk about um, Karma Cloud and how Karma Cloud might fit into this um, environment. So imagine Karma Cloud provides these um, system level services that allow that support decision making for traffic management services. And imagine then you could integrate information from the transit management system, like I spoke of earlier about routes, schedules, and maybe even some information on vehicle status, right? And then we could use that kind of information. Uh, for making decisions. And so the decisions could be made at the street level, but be informed by things at the cloud level. Um, so in Karma Cloud, there's, there's a group of things called system objects and model layers that have layers for different things like special events or the traffic layer or road weather, um, traffic control layer, infrastructure like uh, HD lanes and and the, the network uh, structure, the layout of the network, and the, the physical structure and the, the, of the landforms and things. Uh, and then maybe we could add a transit layer that would have that information about routes and schedules. Um, and then we would have different kinds of system objects that would be there. And, and what's appealing to me as a researcher about Karma Cloud is it gives us a way to start modeling some of this information. Oftentimes when we do modeling and simulation of of say TSP, for example, we just let all of the vehicles request priority all of the time. And, and we're not really simulating the, the transit system operations that's there. And I think we'll really begin to see the effectiveness and, and the lack of impact if we're able to simulate at, at all the different levels. And so Karma Streets is this um, new addition to the Karma uh, ecosystem that allows the vehicle to infrastructure platform at the roadside to have computational capabilities, right? And so it can coordinate communication among connected travelers and connected vehicles that are out there. It can give information to automated vehicles, you know, through cooperative driving automation. Uh, and, and so what it really does is it provides this edge computing at, at the edge of the roadway, whether it's at an intersection or other places on the roadway, it's there. And so Karma Streets can be thought of as communicating with the roadside unit and, and communicating with other Karma-capable karma vehicles that are out there. And so some of the intersection management can be done there. And if we add the traffic signal controller and we get, say, SPAT data out of the controller and we can talk back to the controller and, and get into a, a relationship with the controller uh, to make decisions. And then um, in, in other CDA use cases that are being considered, there might actually be sensors in the infrastructure that are that are observing the system and and providing data like from cameras or LIDAR or FLIR or other kinds of, of sensors that are there that could help inform Karma Streets and share information with other vehicles that are out there. So cooperative perception is the key term there. And then Karma Platform is what's on the vehicle. And, and this is the decision making on an automated vehicle for doing the driving and the localization and the route planning and, and such that's out there. And if we can imagine in the karma planning, if it's a transit type of vehicle that's automated and, and we're thinking about making decisions, then we could integrate something like the priority request generator into the plan stack. And it could say, oh, I, I'm running behind. I've got a lot of passengers on board. I'm approaching an intersection. Let me ask for priority to see if I can get a little help from the infrastructure to get us through the system, okay? And so I think we can see how each of the Karma components could help play a role in, in, in this um, transit management and especially transit signal priority. 
So um, Govan, actually, I think I would ask you to, to cover these slides related to the KARMA program. You're Amir. Um, so Larry, thanks. Uh, I was actually going to, you know, present the, the comments, just, you know, a slide, but uh, that's okay. I mean, so um, I would like to, you know, at this point maybe um, I would like to quickly talk about some additional activities that are going on on, on the Karma program. So um, we are currently um, we are currently developing Karma Cloud and Karma Street. So those products will be ready in next few months. So uh, I would say, you know, let's. Um, stay tuned for uh, additional, you know, updates on that. Um, so for Karma Street, we are going to use and demonstrate its functionality on our Sysmo use cases that are, you know, transit management and transit uh, incident man traffic incident management. Um, in addition, we have a very interesting research going on, which is called Karma One Ten. So for that, we are implementing some of our Karma platform capabilities on on some scaled down test vehicles. Um, so the aim is to basically test and showcase karma with much lower, you know, expenses, risks, and liabilities. Um, we have another interesting project called Karma Portrait. Um, so in this project, we demonstrate a proof of concept application to support the port management use case. Um, so we're going to use um, a fleet of four, you know, karma equipped heavy vehicles uh, on that project. And last but not the least, we, are, we have a no-cost support from our Karma Support Services that aims to basically address any questions or issues related to Karma research. Um, so um, this slide shows two communication and support channels for Karma research and development. Uh, Karma Collaborative is the focal point for industry-wide collaboration on CDA R&D through uh, the Karma uh, platform. So basically, it uh, aims to engage diverse stakeholders, including academics, uh, public agencies, uh, private companies, and industry associations to uh, to accelerate CDA R&D. On that, uh, we also try to advance karma, uh, encourage peer exchange, and demonstrate the, benef the benefits of industry adoption. So if you're interested in joining our community of karma users and stakeholders, please email uh, karma at dot.gov. Uh, we hold, you know, regular webinars on, uh, with Karma updates as well as, you know, some panels, conference sessions, and technical working groups. Um, as mentioned, uh, Karma Support Services is the main point of contact to answer your technical questions and issues related to Karma research and development. Um, so this service is available to all users free of charge. So if you have any technical questions or support requests, Please email karma support um, at doc.gov, and our team will provide you with the uh, with the support that you need. Um, in addition to that, karma support services develop and deliver training, guidance, and support materials and documentation um, to basically assist karma users and collaborators. Um, the documentation is available online on our karma uh, confluence pages, which is shown in the next slide. Um, so um, to learn more about Karma, I would encourage you, you know, to visit our online resources shown here. Uh, I believe they are also posted in the link part of the webinar window. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I will hand it back over to Larry to continue on the, the TSU discussion. Thanks, Amir. Um, so. What we want to do is, is map or, or think about the different kinds of cooperative driving automation capabilities that Karma brings to this um, TISMO TSP use case role. And so as I mentioned, the Karma Cloud is a place where the information related to the location of the transit stops and route and schedule information, <coughs> vehicle status, like occupancy, lateness type of service, um, and the network status, like the general transportation network, are there work zones or incidents or traffic congestion, and what's the weather like? And so the, the appeal of Karma Cloud for a research platform is that all of this kind of information could be available so that, say, algorithms that are running in place like Karma Streets, like connected vehicle services, multimodal priority control, intelligent signal control, Q-Link estimation, and other kinds of of traffic control things that we may, might want to do, that 
are at the edge where Karma Streets is, they can get that information out of Karma Cloud. And then once they communicate with the vehicle, the vehicle can do things like request to be the priority request generator or generate blip messages to tell other vehicles to get out of the way. And so we've tried to classify these as being class A, B, C, or D in the CBA levels, and many of them are class A, which is just informing about what's going on. But you could see that like in the blip use case, the Karma platform, the, an automated vehicle could be informed, please vacate the lane and maybe do that in a cooperative manner with other vehicles that are there so that the, the bus can get through or the transit vehicle can use that, that intended lane. So what we wanted to do was talk about what's, what we've done in the MITS project and how this maps to the Karma ecosystem and, and how we could then realize the overall goal of having a new generation of traffic signal control that utilizes connected vehicle data that's available over the wireless communication that does intelligent signal control, priority and preemption for emergency vehicles, priority for transit vehicles, priority for freight vehicles, and pedestrian applications. And so that's the goal of MITS, and I think you can probably see as I can that there's going to be a nice relationship between um, MITS and the Karma ecosystem. And so here's a couple of um, the slides contain some information about how to get information about MITS. It's a cooperative uh, a connected vehicle pool fund project. Uh, the partners have been FHWA, University of Virginia, University of California Berkeley PATH program, and University of Arizona. And then our, our champions have been Maricopa County DOT and Caltrans, and our, our partners in the pool fund with Texas DOT, Virginia DOT, Minnesota, Utah, Florida, and many other transportation partners. Maryland and others have been participating in the Connected Vehicle Pool Fund, and it's just been a great environment to discuss and, and to develop MITS over the last several years. Um, so the, for people that aren't familiar with MITS, I want to give you just a little bit of background, and, the, and I call this policy-based control because the idea is that in a, in a transportation system, you have sections of traffic signals that you might operate together for certain uh, objectives, okay? So an operating agency may have a policy that says here in section one, maybe this is an area where there's a lot of uh, manufacturing facilities and warehouses and a lot of freight moving through there. And, and so we might set up a priority hierarchy that says, of course, rail crossings and emergency vehicles are, are important, but then it's freight. And then maybe it's coordination of passenger vehicles. And then a little bit lower, maybe it's transit, okay, or pedestrians. And, and maybe this would change as a time of day. So maybe transit would be more important than coordination if we were moving, uh, you know, workers in and out of the factories, for example. But maybe there's another section over here uh, of the network where it's really important to have good services for, for public transport or transit and pedestrians. Um, you know, that might be a shopping district, it might be where there are schools and things. So we would set up a hierarchy that, again, is rail and emergency vehicles, and then transit, and maybe different kinds of transit services that are available, uh, and maybe only if things are, are late, like the local service that's shown here. And then maybe we want to do some things to better accommodate pedestrians, and then finally, coordination and freight. And, and what MITS tries to do is provide a framework for realizing that priority hierarchy, uh, different modes of vehicles. And the other thing, in, in this is important in, in, in any kind of new system where we have this cooperative driving and where vehicles are sharing information, we can do real-time performance observation by mode, by movement, and by section. And so we can measure things like volume delay, travel time, throughput, stops, smoothness, time and system, and, and other measures that are available because we have this really high fidelity data that's there. And we can measure things like means and variances because of the quality of the data that we have. Uh, MITS has uh, been developed based on the use of the SAE J2735 messages. We use MAP, SPAT, basic safety message, signal request, and signal status message. Uh, SRMs come from emergency vehicles, transit, and trucks, and then the infrastructure returns an SSM message to them as an acknowledgement. Um, we maintain a list of all active requests. Uh, this isn't the kind of system that says, well, it's first come, first serve or anything. It really keeps a, a list of all the active requests, and then it solves a, an optimal scheduling problem to try to consider all of the different requests that are there, the importance that the operating agency has put on those requests, and the structure of the controller. Uh, MITS is, is pretty much based on dual ring eight-phase control at this time but we consider the minimum times walk, pedestrian, clearance time, yellow change interval, red 
interval and such in the decision making. So it's really making use of, of all of the data from the connected vehicles and, and the structure of traffic control. And this is just a quick architecture diagram. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, but if you look on the left-hand side in, in our MITS architecture, I can envision this is, could be integrated into the Karma platform. We've had this MITS vehicle side processor. And in our testing and deployment, we've used a, a simple Raspberry Pi uh, to do this. And it, it really houses the priority request generator. And then it, it sends and receives messages over the, the, the uh, currently using DSRC. It's really agnostic to the technology that's there. Uh, depends upon what the radios are capable of, whether it's cellular Vita X or DSRC or, or maybe some other technology that's out there. And then on the, the road side, we see the MITS roadside processor, which I think is, is anonymous, analogous with the Karma streets. And so uh, we've been using a, a processor in our test bed from Econolite that's a, a, a connected vehicle coprocessor. Uh, Utah uses a Beagle board processor. California uses another Linux processor board to do this. But th this is where the priority request server and the, the solver that solves and gets the optimal schedule, and then it passes it off to the traffic control interface that then talks to the traffic signal controller using uh, NTCIP objects. Uh, the signal controller provides the SPAT data back. Uh, we have to modify the SPAT data emits because we're manipulating the controller to do the priority control that we have, and then the SPAT is broadcast back out over the air. And then MITS has a very simple interface to the cloud right now. We mainly use the cloud-type services for, for storing data that we collect from all the different components that are there. And we have a web browser interface that allows you to do things like configure it and turn it on and off and, and such. So I can see a very natural fit for MITS into the Karma ecosystem. And so the really important MITS components are the priority request generator. Um, it's, it's job is to figure out where the vehicle is and, and, and locate the vehicle on the map, estimate when the vehicle would want to arrive at the stop bar, assuming no queuing and delays and things like that. It could determine eligibility if the information was available to the vehicle. And if it decides to send a signal request message, it can then send the message, monitor its progress, send updates if needed, or cancel it when it passes the stop bar or if something happens. Uh, in Karma, they already have message encoders and decoders and, and systems for capturing and storing data. So there's some of the things that we do in MITS that are available to the platform, um, either whether it's Karma Streets or, or Karma Platform on the vehicle that are there that can support this operation. Um, oops, I didn't advance it. So that's where I, I'm excited to add some new capabilities using Karma Cloud such as the route information, transit stop information. Uh, we could simulate schedules and things and, and then look for in the simulation model to see if the transit vehicles are behind schedule. We can model things like occupancy. Uh, we can use information from downstream congestion if we model a large enough system. Uh, we could look downstream and see that there's congestion and use it in making decisions. Uh, Karma Cloud has analytics that's modeling and simulation that could be used to do predictive type of behavior of what would happen if we did give priority that's there. And then it also can contain information like work zones of congestion and incidents. Um, the analytics, are, I think, is another pretty exciting area. You know, we in this cooperative driving environment where we have connected vehicles, we're, we have so much data, it's unbelievable. And so getting our hands around doing reasonable analytics with the data and using that to support decision making is, is another great capability that Karma's adding, Karma Cloud's adding. So what we want to do now is we've talked about these transit management use cases and the things that we could do for transit management. We've talked about cooperative driving automation and then the research platform that Karma ecosystem has brought to us. So let's talk about some different scenarios and think about the questions that we might ask and the research that we might do using the, the platform. And so um, we'll, we'll talk about these different scenarios, the basic arteria with transit operations. And so we expect to see some benefit in, in reducing traffic signal delay for transit vehicles and maybe delay variability, okay, because we can do this intelligently. Uh, but we know that there may be some increased impact on the non-transit vehicles that are out there. Um, in, in this kind of research, when you shift the priority away from one mode to another mode, there has to be an impact to the other mode. If, 
If there's no impact, then that means you probably didn't start in a, in a well operating system. We can look at route priority um, and, and look at re reducing the signal delay over the service route or a, a section of the route, like maybe between time points uh, would be a good way to do it. Um, and, and again, there may be some increased signal delay for other vehicles. Uh, we can go back to the, the use case of having multiple types of service, and we can lo look at reducing delay for, say, bus rapid transit or express service. What impact does that have on local service, and what impact does it have on the other vehicles? And then a work zone. Uh, if we knew there was a work zone, we might be able to, to help a transit vehicle and plan to help the transit vehicle after it exits the work zone to help get it back on schedule. Uh, we could do something like meter the vehicles that are going to flow into the, the work zone when the transit vehicle is, is approaching. Uh, you know, if we reduce the, the congestion by 10%, that could be a, a big help. Um, we could operate the system with the blip lanes, the, the bus lane intermittent priority. Uh, and this has a huge impact to increase roadway capacity and reduce transit and other vehicle travel times. And then one we didn't talk about earlier, but that, that I think is really important, is using the, the cooperative infrastructure vehicle to do eco-transit driving. So we've, we've had seminars in the past on eco-driving, but think about eco-transit driving. And in a transit fleet, if you can save energy or save fuel, that's a big savings in the operations that are out there. Um, so again, I go back to this kind of uh, general scenario where we have the transit operations, and I think about doing local priority and route-based priority uh, that's there, and we can ask these kind of questions. What are the benefits to the, the cooperative driving automation, TISMO, TSP on a basic arterial? Traffic signal delay, travel time variability. What are the impacts on schedule and headway? So if we have the capability of knowing about schedule and things, can we really do things to help maintain schedule or maintain a headway? Right? And what is the frequency of the vehicles? Is it a five-minute headway? Is it a 10-minute headway? Is it a 15-minute schedule? And so we could vary some of those factors. Um, what are the impacts on conflicting routes and requests? You know, oftentimes when we do studies of transit priority, it's just drive down the arterial and what's the benefit? But if we have, you know, crossing routes and things occurring, we could begin to investigate those impacts. Uh, what's the impact of TSP on if we're trying to operate in coordination? And in MITS, we consider coordination to be just another form of priority, right? We're trying to give priority for the movement of platoons of vehicles through an arterial system. And so if we can integrate transit signal priority with regular coordination in an intelligent way, it, can we have a, a less impact or better benefits? And, and then what's the, the impacts and efficiency on queue clearance to allow a vehicle to reach that near side stop? And how, how does that impact the overall intersection and network that's there. Hopefully by doing this research and answering some of these questions, we can, we can give guidance for deployment and different kinds of networks. And then we want to go and model a corridor like our smart drive test bed in Maricopa County and, and run some simulations and, and try to, to really draw some real world perhaps benefits that are out there. And, and do this also, this is all open source type capability, so it would be really good if we could do this on many different kinds of networks. And so if we're doing route priority and we have multiple types of services available, maybe we want to do something like, you know, we have this vehicle that's turning left. Maybe we would consider giving priority for that vehicle when it's moving in uncongested conditions so it can make the lane change and we don't have to do the, the queue jump type, type service that's out there. Right, and, and so should we do this for one type of service or all types of services? And so we might ask some questions like, what are the benefits on route-based priority and, and delay and variability? What are the impacts of using something like Q-Jump? Or do we need Q-Jump if we can, you know, get the vehicle that's moving when there's, when there's a gap in the traffic? Uh, what's the, the benefits of providing left turn signal priority? All right, so oftentimes we only think of signal priority as being through, but if the route turns left, maybe we could clear the queue and allow the transit vehicle to get the left turn. Uh, and what's the impact if we do this on, on others, whether it's express versus local versus passenger vehicles? And again, I think our intent is to, to look at doing this, provide deployment, uh, some guidance on deployment, and, and model a corridor. And I put the smart drive corridor down for this. Maybe this would be the corridor from Madison. We're in the MITS project. We're working with the city of Madison to do a deployment or, or another network that's out there. 
And then this, this is the blip concept that I talked about before. And this transit vehicle can be broadcasting, the, you know, a message that says, I'm a transit vehicle, I'm coming down the bus lane, you need to get out of the bus lane. And automated vehicles, that could be a class D command to tell them to get out. In non-automated vehicles, it's just information telling them to get out. Uh, but there could be huge benefit from doing this. And the other benefit that, that occurs here is the vehicles that are following the transit vehicle, they move over and get out of the way, and then they get in back behind the transit vehicle, and they get some priority by, by being behind that vehicle. So we could ask questions like, what are the benefits, okay, for, for blip uh, on BRT? What are the impacts? Uh, how does the level of traffic congestion impact the ability to clear the bus lane? So if there's, you know, cars in the other lane and there's nowhere for the cars to get out, uh, how is that going to work out? What's the level of market penetration required to make this work? Uh, can TSP be used to clear downstream signals? Uh, there's, there's a lot of, of, of research questions that could be answered once we get the set of tools and the platform up and working. Um, here's the work zone scenario. So. Uh, this is uh, some slides using uh, the work zone demonstration at Turner Fair Ranks Highway Research Center. You know, well, if we're going to have vehicles go in there, could we do some metering? Could we change the traffic signals at the upstream side to, to benefit people that are taking diversion routes? And, and we could move the transit vehicle through, get it through the work zone. Maybe there's stops in the work zone where the transit vehicle needs to stop. Uh, and then once it gets through, if it's delayed, maybe we could give priority at the downstream signals. Whoops. Uh, so can TSP be used to generate, get vehicles back on schedule? And can TSP as an upstream metering approach be used to reduce congestion? And then the eco transit driving, I, I think there's been some really good work done um, on this for regular vehicles, but could that be applied to transit vehicles and, and saving energy and saving fuel on transit vehicles could be a big impact to the operating budget of, of transit agencies. So um, how much energy savings can be gained if SPAD data is used to inform the transit vehicle of a signal change? And if we're doing this in coordination with changing the signals to give priority, how does that work? And so again, developing some guidelines and some, some concepts for deployment and then testing it out. So our next poll question, I'll turn it over to Nicole, uh, what are the greatest barriers to applying these scenarios? Thanks, Larry. Um, yep, as always, feel free to um, add your thoughts um, in the poll pod. We really love uh, to hear uh, your feedback. Funding support, funding, budgeting, consistency, uh, capabilities of traffic signal controllers in the field, funding for equipment, lots of funding. They're seeing cost and funding and budgeting as um, probably the biggest Great, thanks everyone. And then I think we have one final poll question for you all. Um, so what, in your opinion, um, what are other needs, expectations, uh, or opportunities for improvement that we have not covered that we should cover or consider uh, based on your experience? Or any un unanswered questions? And we'll also have um, a question portion soon, so feel free to also think about those as well.
hardware platforms and devices to map the simulation to a real environment, existing off-street bus terminals, standardization across uh, manufacturers, communication redundancy. Okay, this is great. Compatibility with existing TSP systems. Great, thanks everyone for your feedback. And now we'd like to um, open it up for, um, for your questions. Uh, we've already had some come in, so um, I'll, I'll start with those. But feel free to type any more questions you might have in the chat pod, and, and we'll do our best to address all of these. Um, so first, we have a few questions related to uh, MITs for Larry. Um, so kind of a two-parter question for the first one. Uh, do signal controllers need to be in free mode to use MIT? And if signal controllers are connected to a centralized traffic signal system, can MIT still be utilized? So the way that we operate MITs today is to put the signals into free mode, and then MITs takes care of providing the priority and the um, coordination. Uh, the signal is still allowed to operate you know, as an actuated traffic signal, and within MIT's decisions, we may allow the phases to time and gap out on their own. Uh, but if you put it into coordinated mode and then MITS tried to manipulate the controller to give priority, then that would cause the controller to go into transition and other behaviors. So, so yeah, it does have to be in free mode. And then if you talk about connected to a central system, then I would have to ask the question of what role is the central system performing? You know, some central systems are really monitoring systems that monitor the signal timing, uh, collect data, allow uploads and downloads of databases, and make changes to the signal controllers. Uh, other systems, like the old UTCS systems, are doing second-by-second -second controlling. So if it's trying to control the signals, you wouldn't want MITs and a UTC-type system controlling at the same time. Um, one thing uh, that we did in MITs um, is that we read the data for, for MITs off of the controller. So we use NTCIP to get the minimum green times and things. So if a traffic engineer comes along and changes the min time from 7 to 15, which happened to us, uh, we get that right away by because we read it off the controller. And we don't read the controller in real time. We read it about every minute to get updates to the plans. Uh, but that data is there. So I hope that answers the question. Great. And then our kind of third part uh, to clarify, um, how does MITS estimate the ETA to a stop fire, to a stop bar, particularly because sometimes the ETAs are inaccurate if intersections are far apart? Yeah, so um, the, the way that we do it in the priority request generator, and I think uh, Martin Nathanson answered the question, is that, that we receive the map message that describes the, the infrastructure geometry, which may not be a part of cooperative driving automation, by the way, but we have a map. Let's assume we have a map, and we know where we are on the map, and we know how far it is to the stop bar, and we know our current speed, so we make a simple estimation of the travel time based upon our speed and the distance to the stop bar. Now, if speed changes significantly, then the priority request generator would be monitoring that and would send an update and say, oh, I thought I was going to be there in 20 seconds, but it looks like I'm going to get there in 15, or maybe it's going to be 25, and then MITS will adjust what it's doing based upon those updates that are there. Uh, if there's a queue and the vehicle pulls in behind the queue, then we notice that the speed goes down and the estimated time of arrival goes to zero, but we consider the fact that we're still a ways from the intersection and we need some time to get through. So there's a duration request that's part of it. Great. Um, and then our next question, uh, transit vehicle schedules are developed based on existing trip times. Are you able to provide the transit with new trip times based on the implementation of this system what? Well, I think that that's a better question for someone from a transit agency because I've actually never developed transit schedules. 
Um, I was involved in a project once where we used TSP to help improve performance, and it was given to every vehicle, so quickly they began exceeding the schedule and getting to stops ahead of time where then they had just had to wait because an uh, early bus is, is as bad or worse than a late bus. Um, so I would want to use the tool in an intelligent way, in a cooperative way with a transit agency from a traffic agency to be using it to help vehicles get back on schedule, but I wouldn't want the schedules to depend upon having TSP. That I think it would be better if the schedules, this is my personal opinion, if the schedules were developed to fit more naturally in the, in the signals. I do think, though, that with all the data that's available and the analytics and somewhere like that, that's going to be available through something like Karma Cloud, we can really start to study the interaction between the traffic signals and the transit scheduling algorithms. Fantastic. And then, Larry, we have another question for you. Um, can Karma pull in existing transit data from the general transit uh, feed specification? Yeah, so I think I should make a, a comment about um, like Karma Cloud, especially in, in Karma Streets. Is these are our research platforms that are in development, and they're they're coming forward. They have great capabilities and open architecture and an open source environment, so that there can be collaborators from lots of different directions. The the GTFS uh, specification is well understood. So I would assume that that data could be integrated easily into Karma Platform and, and added to a transit layer that's there. That does not exist today, in my opinion, or in my knowledge. There, you know, Somebody that works on Karma Cloud could probably answer that a lot better than me. Um, what we wanted to do in this webinar and in this project of, of looking at these use cases is, is dream a little bit and dream about what the future in a cooperative driving automation system would be and the benefits that could be there for both transit and, and for traffic uh, in, in, in this TISMO framework. So, uh, so I think that that's not a hard thing to do. Um, thanks. Great. Thanks, Larry. And then we have... Um uh, one final question here. Uh, in this framework, does the transit vehicle have to be human-driven, or uh, can it be a CAV whose speed and tra trajectory can be controlled directly by the framework? Yeah, I think that, that we've tried to consider both cases, but the, the cooperative driving automation or a, an automated transit vehicle is clearly a possibility and a discussion today. And so if you take things like the eco transit driving along with requesting priority and queue jumps, and, and there's no reason that couldn't be done by an automated vehicle. Fantastic. Uh, do we have any more questions? We'll wait just a second. Looks like we might have a question coming in. Um, are you considering energy benefits in TSP? If so, is it based on vehicle or person? Yeah, so we, we don't, in, in the MITS TSP, we don't have a specific consideration for energy right now. Um, so I would leave that up to experts, you know, like you that um, maybe would want to make some modifications or propose some algorithmic changes that do consider energy. Uh, we really, in MITS today, we work on delay of these special kinds of vehicles or coordination requests that are there to tr try to make the decisions. But I could clearly see that being wrapped up into an energy um, calculation at some point, especially if you're going to do something like eco-transit driving. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Larry. I think we have maybe one last question coming in. Um, okay. Is there any research studies that show significant benefits for implementing um, the COOP environment in TSP? That would be useful. I think that that's actually what this project is set out to try to do is to try to demonstrate some of the cooperative um, 
driving automation and using that, that under the TISMO TSP use case. And so what benefits are there and, and can we, you know, get more benefits and mitigate um, some of the impacts that are there? I think one of the other things that I need to mention um, coming from the, the other chat box is there's a, another version of MITS called MITS California. There's actually two versions. There's a MITS Utah and a MITS California. Uh, the MITS California version is, is less adaptive in a way than what we do in the MITS Arizona, we call it. Um, the, the, in, in California, they have controllers that have their TSP algorithms um, built into the controllers. And so then the MIT system really does things like manages coordination and manages where the vehicles are and then uses the algorithmic features on the controller to give the priority. Uh, in Utah, they used a similar function, especially because their traffic engineers weren't, weren't uh, happy to put signals into free mode. And, and at the time, MITS didn't have a coordination capability. This was in version two of MITS, phase two project. And so they modified the MITS that they use in Utah to use the signal controller priority capabilities that are there. So instead of solving the optimal scheduling problem that we do in MITS Arizona, they gathered the request, managed the request, and then called the function on the controller. They passed the signal request information onto the controller to get the controller to do signal timing. And, you know, look, I'm a researcher and I know that as we do the research, if it turns out to be beneficial, some of the signal controller manufacturers will implement features that are similar along the same lines on the controllers. And I think we already see some of those things happening. I think there's some really innovative people out there that are doing some, some new and different kinds of things. And so I think what we're seeing is the whole industry is beginning to grow up and now as we move into this cooperative driving automation, we want to answer questions like, what are the benefits and, and should we be implementing this? And what is the guidance for doing this that, that we could be given? So uh, I think we have a, a really great opportunity. Uh, I'm super happy about the Karma ecosystem and the tools that are available to implement things. When we started off on the MITS research, we didn't have a platform like Karma to implement on. So being part of <clears throat> an effort to bring MITS into that environment is, is exciting. So thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks. Um, and actually, uh, Brendan is wondering more if you could provide more detail on the, um, the planned pilot maybe uh, in Maricopa County. So I might leave that as a question for Suji. Um, I mentioned Maricopa County a lot because that's where we've been doing a lot of the MITS research. We have several five deployment projects in Maricopa County now, um, so it's moving forward there. Um, but for this project in the cooperative driving automation, I don't know that we've actually selected a, a place to go and do a, a field demonstration. Sujit, do you want to address that? Uh, yes, Larry, and uh, you are right. Uh, we are a little early in the uh, stages and preparing the uh, concept of operations uh, for this research, and uh, we have been evaluating on the test sites uh, uh, to deploy this, uh, uh, you know, application. So it, we, we will definitely start off with our uh, federal uh, uh, highway administrative uh, facility, Turner, uh, Turner Fairbank up in McLean, Virginia, and then uh, also evaluate uh, uh, some of the facilities, uh, uh, you know, including the one that, uh, uh, you know, Larry has mentioned in uh, Arizona to see if uh, if they would be a correct candidates to, uh, you know, deploy this feature. Uh, as of now, the research is still going on and uh, we are still evaluating the test sites. Great, thank you. Um, and I believe that is the last of the questions. So. Um, if there's no more questions, I think we can go ahead uh, and wrap up. I'll just point out again the, the useful links and the Karma web link um, to check out if you have any more questions. Uh, please reach out to the Karma team uh, via the email address if you have any questions. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. All right, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. I also wanna thank our panelists and moderator. We had some good information today. Like I mentioned in the beginning, a recorded version of this webinar will be available on the NOCO website. On behalf of the National Operations Center of Excellence and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.